But if you watch these videos that I've done, the whole idea is to kind of clear up the process, make it as simple as understand to as possible because it's not that complicated. It's just people in the planning world adding weird abbreviations to things to make them sound. I don't know why they make them sound so complicated, but they do. So don't be scared by the complexities. It's just a matter of knowing where to look and how to apply it. And then if you apply it to a planning application or a site that you're considering developing, then you're in with a really good chance of getting permission. You'll be able to approach the council with so much more confidence than most people who just throw in an application, get angry at the whole process because they don't understand it, and generally get frustrated with the whole development process and end up being scared away from the whole thing. So if you want to learn more about the planning process and how you can unlock value out of any property, click the link below to learn more. So I saw a video the other day on a property channel and they were discussing planning. And I guess I wasn't surprised to hear about the content, which was generally a moaning about the system, a moaning about officers, and a general frustration with the whole process, whether it be how long it takes, how onerous it is, um, how inconsistent it is, and the general lack of access you have to local officers, council officers, and also the departments. So I wanted to put together this video in kind of response to that, but also give you an idea of what it's like at a council, what happens behind the scenes, what happens when your application is received, why is it received in a certain way, why do things take so long, why are decisions inconsistent. And I would say that I have represented, I've been in the planning system for over a decade and I've been on both sides of the table. So I've been on the private side, I was a private consultant, so I've been on that side where people submit applications, they negotiate with planning officers, they try and get hold of planning officers, they try and get decisions. And for the most of my career I was on the public side, so I've been on the side where I've received those applications and I've kind of known the strategies that have come in with them behind behind the submission and I've also got to see the inner workings of a council which is I think the most valuable thing that's come out of all of all of that but I just want to touch on a context of this that generally sparked my reason for making this video and that was why I decided to become a planning officer in the video I watched there was there was talk about the generalization of planning officers what they're like how there was mention of an officer responding to someone saying, sorry, I didn't get your decision out on time last night. There was a cat on my keyboard. There was a discussion about this, these crazy reasons why decisions weren't made on time because of these issues going on whilst people are working at home. And I wanted to shed some light on what life is like as a planning officer. So the reason why I got into planning is that I started my career on the private sector. I was trying to negotiate schemes, I was trying to get permission. That was in residential, retail, commercial, all these kinds of things. And more often than not, you found that you were getting refusal. But the process that planning consultants were going through, at least my firm was going through, was that how can you set your application out ready for refusal? So what do you need to say now so that when you get refused, you know you have your case already in place for when your appeal comes in? So that was kind of a weird way of working. And the reasons why I went to work for a council was to actually understand what good development was. Why are things approved and others aren't? Why, why is it that all the schemes that we're trying to get permission for are getting kicked back from the council? Why is that? So that's why I went to the local council and I think I got a good understanding as to the answer. So the first thing I can say, and it's linked to the time it takes for everything to happen. It is incredible how long the permissions take to get issued. And there are many reasons behind it. And my time as a planning officer has revealed why that is. And it's not a pretty picture, unfortunately. So. I'm sure you everyone knows that local government is desperately low on cash. Government cuts after government cuts have meant that all departments within a council have been slashed and it's just meant that they've worked on tighter and tighter resources. They've tried to squeeze as much as they can out of, in this case, planning officers to ensure that the service isn't interrupted. But the issue is, is that despite the squeeze on the planning departments, the development industry has not slowed down, as I'm sure you know. Applications fly in all the time, no matter whether it's COVID, it's a recession, the amount of applications that come into an a, a council have never stopped. The flow has never stopped. And even with permitted development changing, the amount of applications that have come in are a huge, huge amount. So there's never that been that release of development, yet in the context of underspend on planning departments, there's this issue where it gets to a critical point where planning officers can issue no more decisions, no matter how more efficient they are, the, the flow of work will just continue to come and it will get bigger and bigger and bigger 
and it puts councils in a difficult position. But the biggest issue I have with that is that planning departments are actually one of the biggest fee earners within a council. So there are departments that they will get funding from central government or other pots and they will get a proper resource together to deliver that project because it's based on external funding so they have to ensure that they meet that funding. But planning departments create a huge amount of income whether that's through section 106, whether that's through pre-app fees, whether it's through the actual application fees, whether that's through the creation of SIL money through development. You know, they create millions and millions of pounds no matter what authority it is, they create millions of pounds that all right, still, that's strategic. That can go into certain things. But there's other things around planning where they create they create money as a direct result of the planning input that's put in. But that is not put back into the planning department. So despite the fact that they're creating all this money, development continues to roll on. It creates fees. It creates revenue for the council. But it does not go into the front line. And it means that this issue just continues endlessly. It's where planning departments are desperate for cash to get the resources, to get the people in, but they can't do it because the money that they've created is being funneled elsewhere. And it means that you don't get good talent because they because this bigger picture of how council, the council life is, about how it's underspend and how it's hard to work and things like that, it means that the best talent don't go there because they go to the private sector for money. So that's the kind of bigger picture as to what's going on. And I hope it gives you an understanding as to what it's like financially anyway within a council. So as a result of that, there are some tactics that I would think about if you're going to submit a planning application. First of all, I would get very clear on what the issues are for a site. When you submit a planning application, you need to make sure before you submit it that you know what the issues are. And you don't necessarily need a planning consultant for that. Like I said, I've worked with the private consultants and I've worked on most of my career in the public sector. And the value that a planning consultant actually adds to a process, generally speaking, unless it's a major application or a very complex issue, it's not that great. And planning consultants are very expensive and they'll happily spend your money on things that aren't very effective. Whereas if you learn the process yourself and you understand what the main issues are, then before you even get consultants on board, you kind of have an understanding that you know what the issues are, you know roughly how expensive it's going to be, and you know what the issues, the planning issues are going to be within the council and what that means for you. So as a result of that, sometimes it can't be avoided, but I would look for schemes that have the fewest amount of planning issues possible because when an application goes to a council, if you have a heritage issues, if you have noise issues, if you have sustainability issues, you have tree issues, development issues, and support, each of those issues has to be considered by a relevant officer within that council. The council officer doesn't, is not an expert on all those things. So when they, get the, when they get the application, they refer those matters to those people. And each of those people have their own deadlines, have their own workflow, have their own issues going on within their department. So that means that the more issues there are, the higher chance there is that you're not going to get a response on time, speaking from a planning officer's point of view. And that can be why you don't get your decisions on time. So not only are the council's officers under pressure, but also the departments that council officers are referring to on certain matters are also squeezed. They also have their issues going on. So keep the issues the best you can to a minimum. That's the reason why you get so many requests for an extension of time from a council. You're wondering why that is. So the central government put pressure on councils to make sure that they determine applications on time. So if you've gone past the eight weeks and you just you determine something within eight weeks without an extension of time, that basically gets lodged as late. And if you have a certain percentage of applications that are determined late or not on time, then eventually, if it gets bad enough, the inspector will step in and make decisions for you. Now, that rarely happens because councils as a workaround, they create extensions of time. So extensions of times, you'll get an email close to the decision date. I need some more time or is would you accept a decision date of it is next Tuesday or next month or whatever it is. And you might get that repeatedly. Now, the issue, the reason they're doing that is because it's to do with their stats. They want to make sure that they can control their own development. So that kind of gives the picture as to why things are slow within a council. Financial pressures, every department's got their own issues going on. Try to keep your the issues for your scheme to a minimum so you can have the best chance of getting your planning permission issued on time. But stepping away from that and in terms of tactics about how to approach the council, I just wanted to touch on a few things. One of them being pre-application. A lot of people think that pre-application is their way into a council. It's your immediate chance to discuss something with an officer 
and then it means that you're going to kind of get a assisted route through the planning system now in an ideal world that is true what pre-application is is that you submit a kind of notional scheme to a, to the department where it is and they will give you feedback on that as to its acceptability and what the issues are now the thing about pre-application advice is that it's not binding so it's not a public record so that means that when when someone applies for pre-application advice they'll get advice on a scheme but there'll be a line somewhere on the statement that says this is not binding to the council now you have to take that seriously because quite often councils do go back on that and that is for a multitude of reasons one is sometimes officers leave and someone with an, an officer with a different view comes in now those difference of views shouldn't happen because everything should be moderated with a with a manager but sometimes things slip through the cracks just because of massive workloads so sometimes issues get through that don't get picked up because there's such a volume that stuff gets missed so pre-application advice can be helpful on certain issues but it also sometimes in my opinion is not worth it pre-application is best used for very very complex issues things like changes of use on a site that that's unclear as to what the result will be major developments in particular pre-application advice is useful but pre-application advice like i said it's not binding and it can be just as long as getting a planning permission issued so, so just bear that in mind if you're considering using pre-application Another, another issue I wanted to mention was conditions on planning permissions. So when you get issued with a planning permission, conditions are added. So you get very excited, I've got planning permission, great. But the next few pages are really, really critical because sometimes, well, you will get conditions on, an app, on a planning permission. Sometimes they're called pre-commencement. So before you start any works, you must submit certain details to get, uh, to get cleared off. Sometimes it's before occupation. So if you're doing a residential building, there'll be a preoccupation or condition or sometimes it'll be above slab works so if you get to the ground level you can't go any further until you have discharged certain points now these are very very important to check but also if you kind of know that those conditions are coming I would adv strongly advise to cut those off at the past so all conditions are put there for extra detail so that the council can feel comfortable about something and it isn't necessarily appropriate to doing through the planning application process even though they might not think it's appropriate, you can clear off any matter you want within the, the process, within reason. So for instance, if, you're, if you have a condition for cycle storage, make sure you put the detail of that cycle storage in as best you can. Cut it off of the past. Don't create any more reasons to delay the process. Because A, it will delay the process when you come to submit the application. And if, you're, if your development is based off of loans, the issue with conditions is a big one because there will be a certain level of comfort that the bank will want based on the amount of conditions you have on that permission. They may not lend if you have too many conditions. So bear that in mind. Try and submit as much detail as you can to reduce the amount of conditions because it means that there's a long development process or a long planning process even after you get planning permission and well before you get the chance to build or finally realize the kind of revenue once you've completed the development. And the last thing I would say is that don't be scared about the complexities of planning. A lot of abbreviations and acronyms are used and weird planning terminology is used and that can scare a lot of people off and make them kind of confused about the whole process. But if you watch these videos that I've done, the whole idea is to kind of clear up the process, make it as simple as understand to as possible because when I was starting out in my career, I didn't understand any of this stuff and it's just through exposure that I know what it is and it's not that complicated it's just people in the planning world adding weird abbreviations to things to make them sound I don't know why they make them sound so complicated but they do so don't be scared by the complexities it's just a matter of knowing where to look and how to apply it and then if you apply it to a planning application or a site that you're considering developing then you're in with a really good chance of getting permission so don't be scared by it don't let it scare you off just learn the basics and then you will be able, you'll be able to approach the council with so much more confidence than most people who just throw in an application, get angry at the whole process because they don't understand it and generally get frustrated with the whole development process and end up being scared away from the whole thing. So don't let that be you. Just get a clear understanding of what the issues are, what the terminology is and my videos will help. Submit a comment if there's anything below, the, anything that you want me to talk about to clear up something for you, and I'll be happy to do that. But I'll see you on the next video.